Good morning, church. Welcome to 3 and 1 in our fellowship. Uh, we're here online every Sunday at 10 o'clock, and uh, we have Zoom opportunity for Bible study on Tuesdays. Uh, throughout the week, we have prayer times on our Facebook page, which brings us this morning. There is now a 3 and 1, a, 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 a fellowship for, the, for, for, uh, for our Facebook, just for that. Reminder, our food pantry is still open. It was open just this, just this Friday. Uh, we are still supporting our students in Uganda through, through, through AOET. Uh, our baby mission, mission this past week had a home delivery of diapers and cleaning the supplies to grandparents who uh, just took on the responsibility of a three-year-old as um, mom is in recovery. And uh, our church met this week or planned in Zoom to uh, begin process of rebooting and there'll be details on the Facebook page and on uh, our websites as they become available as we continue to get ready to begin the process of phase one church. As of now it will be at least until June before that starts. We ask you again to please email us, message us, with prayer requests and needs as you wish, and to join us in any of those uh, those online the, the opportunities as you possibly can. As we come together to, to today, we're going to be reading from Ephesians in chapter 4. In fact, we'll be preaching on the whole chapter 4, but I'm going to share with you just a section of it now, and then we'll go through it from beginning to, to, to uh, the end. So in that time, if you haven't gotten your Bible out yet, then go get it, open up your Bible app, and turn to the New Testament, Ephesians. That's, a, that's one of Paul's letter, the, the, the letters and um, in chapter 4. We're going to begin at verse 11 now. And now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and to build up the uh, church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature, like children, we won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, so the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. The Word of God for the, for the, the, uh, the people of God. And God's people said, thanks be to, to, to God. We come together in prayer for uh, this morning. We especially lift, we lift up our sister Esther and all of her family as she is going through a little more difficult time than she has been. And yet at the same time, 
We have many others still that we are lifting up in uh, prayer. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. To you, loving God, we give all praise and all thanks, even in the midst of this struggle. And yet, Lord, this morning, some of us are excited as we enter the early stages of phase one in the transition for the coronavirus. Yet at the same time, there is a fear that comes with that transition. Is it the right time? How do we know it's the right time? Will it ever be the right time? And yet those questions, some we can answer and some, like it or not, will be by trial and error. Humankind does not have all the answers. And some of that is a struggle, particularly as humans, we desire to be in control and think that we can solve everything when we must acknowledge that God is on his throne, God is in control, whether it's through life or death. This morning, we lift up to you those who are leading the way, those who are probably at this very moment in a laboratory working on drugs that may mitigate, working on vaccines that may prevent. Even though historically we know sometimes these things don't come to the fruition we would like to see, we must trust and must guarantee that our lives are secure in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've already lifted up Esther, but we do that again, Lord, and pray your healing hands upon a true woman of God, a leader in our parish who has done so much for so many. And Lord, we pray your healing hands to be upon her. We continue to lift up Mike and Twala, to lift up all of those who are unemployed. Lord God, in the past week, we have begun to hear concerns about children and spouses who have been many weeks in a home that was abusive before and it's getting worse we give you thanks for those in our food pantry and the food pantries around the 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 uh, community thanks for for those who, who in this last week when we cried out for help and the need for diapers the diaper cabinet is full Lord, your people are being the body of Christ. May your people continue to demonstrate what we're going to call today mature Christianity. May we do that and may we trust and know that you truly are on the throne. You are on your throne. You are in charge. You're not punishing you are doing what you promised for those of us who trust in the Lord and walk humbly with you. You will walk us through, around, and in all aspects take us into any fire or struggle of this life. We know this to be true because you assured it to your apostles who then passed it on for generations. You even taught them how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever.
morning again, folks. I am Rick Osler. I'm pastor here at 3 and one at the, at the Fellowship. We are on combined min the uh, ministry of Dorsey Emanuel and Melville Cha Chapel and Wesley Chap Chapel Churches. We are, all three of us are in the Howard County side uh, of, uh, of um, Howard, uh, the Howard County side of the line at Howard Down Arnold County line. And we are in what we call the Route 1, the, the uh, corridor as we uh, invite you to our online worship and welcome you there. We're in the fourth week of a series entitled It Is Not Finished, and the title for this morning is A Mature Church, which may come across a little unusual. What is a mature church? I mean, what does that mean? You know, on this Mother's Day, which is a day we are celebrating, and by the way, please check out our Facebook page. There'll be a couple of videos up through, through, throughout the day to honor moms. Some of them maybe even get a good laugh in about the struggles of motherhood, and we uh, invite you to follow along on uh, those and enjoy us. We also have a worship uh, short devotion at 5.30 this evening um, that will be on our YouTube page and on our Facebook pages. So but this, on this Mother's Day, we begin talking about maturity. And you know what's interesting is at least even my mom, who will be, um, she'll kill me for, for this, but she'll be 83 in just a couple of days. Still doesn't like to talk about her, her age or her level of what we sometimes call maturity being the physical signs of aging. But you know, many moms, they, they see good news in uh, maturity. And they see difficult news in uh, maturity. You know, some of our moms have embraced it in, in knowledge. They like the idea that, that they're mature moms who, and, and strong women who, who are leading their families and raising kids in a strong way. But maybe they haven't quite embraced the physical maturities of the gray hair or maybe a wrinkle or two that comes along with it. In fairness, I would tell you as a dad that sometimes I don't always embrace the physical maturity of gray hair or missing hair or wrinkles. But see, being mature as a parent is really important. You know, unfortunately, as a teacher and as a pastor, I've seen, like the church has seen, the challenges of immaturity in motherhood, fatherhood, and even in general human or personhood. And I've seen the struggles of that in the church and out of the church. You know, we look at our society and it is a fact, children having children is problematic to our society. Oh, that doesn't condemn those beautiful lives that are born into it, or those young parents who are struggling to be, to be parents, but it is a problem as a whole. See, adults also, though, we then turn in and take adults and treat them as children until they're 30. And there's really no benefit to society or to the individuals by doing that. We end up never having mature young adults. You know, I get that a None of us are lining up to get the gray hair or to lose our hair or to get the wrinkles. But being mature is more than physical aging. You know, it's something that we should expect from one another, a level of maturity. It's something that we should be teaching our children. Being mature allows us to grow intellectually, socially, and emotionally. What I've found in times, particularly when I was teaching school, that sometimes maturity is more evident in 12-year-olds than it is in 30 or 50-year-olds. I can remember students who sometimes displayed more maturity about their situation than their parents did. And I think that's a little bit of what Paul is seen in this church at Ephesus. Remember, there's this church here, and there's some heresy in the church, and there's some problems. And Paul, I think here, is going after maturity because he sees it as a benefit, and he sees the problem of spiritual immaturity 
as what is causing the church a lot of difficulty. Paul opens in chapter 4, and I said we'd go back to that at the beginning, so if you got your Bibles now, we can look at verse 1, since I didn't read it the uh, last time. Paul opens in chapter 4 in writing about the need of unity in the body of Christ. He says, Therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. See, you're allowing it because you love them, not because you necessarily approve, all right? But Paul says we do have to allow it. As we go on, that's a level of maturity. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit, binding yourselves to, to, together with peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. You see, I think this is Paul trying to be the teacher or parent that I like to think that I was or that, or, or, uh, that I am. And, and, and he's talking to, the, to, to this group of folks who are showing at least a little evidence of immaturity. You see, I can hear myself either talking to my girls when, 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 uh, they, when they were young or to my students. And I look at them and say things a little like Paul. Paul says, like, basically, we're all in this together. You know, today we're hearing that a lot. We're all in this together, and yet we know that this is affecting all of us a lot differently. Some who are employed and have to go, some who are unemployed, wish they could, some who are sick, some who are not. We're all in it together, yet differently. But wasn't that the same growing up in our families? Wasn't that the same as when I taught school? You know, had had hundreds of kids in the building, all different, but yet all in there for uh, together. So Paul goes, in my mind, it's sort of like, or maybe things are like, Paul's looking at it and saying, yeah, we're all different. You know, we're all coming from these new new ways, or, or these, these older ways, to this new way called Christianity. And we're trying to sort it out. So we're all coming in this. But you know what? We all get up and put our pants on the same way, one leg at a time. Something I always heard in my house, and took me the longest time to figure, to, to, uh, to, uh, figure out how that was the same but one leg at a time. It's a little hard to jump both legs in at the same time. So we go back and we look at these verses, though, and we see that, that he says, he says, be humble and gentle. Humble and gentle, okay? In other words, yeah, you don't have to agree. You may not approve, but you also don't have to be ridiculously rude. See, but the other goes to the other side, too, in that you need to also listen to yourself. So you're not the burden that forces other people to bite their lip, to hold their tongue, because what you're doing is as rude as their response was going to be. Make every effort to have yourselves united in one. In words, be part of the team. But everybody's got a little something that's, that's going to be different. Make sure that you're united in the one spirit. He's telling the church, one spirit. And that is Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Be united in that. Bind yourselves together with peace. Don't tear each other apart. Work to pull it together. To, to, uh, For there's one body and one spirit. You see, even in that, there's one. And we're going to come back to that again and address it because somehow we sometimes think that one means we're always going to agree with everybody. And we're not. We're not always going to agree. We're not agreeing right now on whether people should go back to work, on whether people should play golf, or whether they should be able to get in their boat. Somehow we've chosen sides and decided that somehow we know absolutely everything's right. And short of those who are out there on the front lines, friends in my own family who look at me and say, Unless you were here in the emergency room, you wouldn't understand. 
So Paul feels like he has their attention now. And he, and he has their attention, and now he's going to talk to them about being part of this team. So now Paul, he, he, he wants to look at them, and he goes on and he says, so we're all on the same team, right? Okay, we're now that one spirit, we're all on God's team, and that you were equally chosen and are equally valuable to the team. You know, I remember being a young, a young lay leader in the church many years ago. And yes, I actually was young once, and actually it wasn't that long ago that I don't remember it. I do remember it. But I heard one of the trustees complaining because no one in the church wanted to volunteer to do the manual labor. No one wanted to paint. No one wanted to build and do the plumbing and all of that stuff. And, and he said, all they want to do is sing in the choir or they teach Sunday school, or they run meetings. Big deal. In his mind, the most important thing that could be done in the church was manual labor. You see, I think that was the first time that I began to understand the challenge of managing the different gifts of the Spirit in the body of Christ that we call the church. I later found myself using a similar, similar a, and, and an analogy when I was a physical educator. And some of my parents of students would come in, or my colleagues would view my subject area, maybe you were one of them, as less than other areas. I mean, after all, I wasn't math or science, or I wasn't English, or for the musicians, I wasn't music. And I would remind them that it took me just as long to go to school as it did them. And that I probably could not have done their schoolwork any more than they could have done mine. Then finally, that would progress to me being a little more confident, or as my wife would say, arrogant. And that I told them from a physical educator fitness point of, of view, that that brilliant mind that they were developing, that brilliant mind that they had, that they said was the end all of everything, would die the same time as their weakened body. But I also said to those who considered themselves the jocks of the world, the physically fit, that you're well trained, well-coordinated body would be pretty useless without a good functioning mind to tell it what to do. You see, mature minds are not completely focused on self. They, they see how they fit in the big picture. And to be a mature church, we need that. It doesn't mean everything goes or everything is right. Mature minds and people see value even in the ignorance of others. Ig ignorance, not in a bad way. But what good am I as a teacher if there is not someone in need of my knowledge? See, Paul wanted the church to see that God had given each of them special gifts. And that those gifts could only, Scripture is really clear, only come from Christ. And that Christ was not just some human dishing out gifts. And he wasn't just some God. But in whatever way, and we don't, we're not able to discern all of that now, but a mature Christian works daily at trying to understand divinity, being fully God, fully man, all at the same time. You see, he wanted them to understand this, and he said at this beginning in verse 8, he said, this is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the to the, the the heights, that he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice it says, he ascended. This clearly means, this is still Paul writing to the church, this clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world, meaning he was human. And, at the, and, and the same one who descended is the one who then ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. 
Paul continues at verse 11 and says, Now these are the gifts that Christ gave to the church. He gave gifts of being apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their responsibility, all the gifts, your gifts, whatever they are, even if it isn't in that category, the responsibility of our gifts, if we are mature as Christians, Paul says, is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, which is the body of Christ. See, Paul is telling them it's not good enough just to have gifts. It's not good enough, but we must know the source of our gifts. See, sometimes I think folks in the church think they got their gifts through just their DNA. You're right for some of them. I got the gift of not being tall from my mom's DNA. My brother's got the gift of my dad's to be tall via DNA. But our gifts, that DNA has a root, and that comes from Christ. We are to use them as we get them. You see, immature Christians accept God gave them gifts, but they sometimes think that those gifts are for them to use any way that, uh, that uh, they, they, they really want. They miss that it says that the responsibility of our gifts is to equip God's people to do His, God's work, and build up the church, the body of Christ. Immature Christians see them as self. See, because in that, in that, we have to understand that somehow we believe that we earned the gifts, but we didn't earn anything. They were given. Or we sometimes act like we were entitled to them. We're not entitled to any of them. In fact, in verse 13, it says, this will continue. This Remember what this, this was? Our responsibility to teach and build up the, the body. This will continue until we come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, not just any God, God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord. Our gifts have to be used until we become mature. And then the final words were measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. You know, folks, in this world, we're probably never going to completely measure up, but we are supposed to be going there. As John Wesley said, we're going on to perfection. Paul finishes this out in 14 to, to, verse, to verse 16. Then there will no longer be, then we will no longer be immature like children. Immature like a child. I want what I want. I need to have it when I have it. I don't want to do that. That's hard work. I don't want to share my testimony. I don't want to figure out that the Bible reads differently in the letters than it does in the Psalms. No, we won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching because we will have become mature and well-rounded, as we said last week. We will not be influenced when, when people try to trick us with, with lies that are so clever they sound like the truth. Folks, you know who he's talking about. It's probably some of us. Some of us are really good at telling the story the way we see it. Instead, Paul says that we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, the head of the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. You're right. He takes Crazy Joe and Crazy Betty and all the rest of us and makes us fit when we focus on being mature. And to be mature, we have to be in Christ. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow, and the whole body is healthy, growing full of love. You see, a mature church is essential. It's essential for others to see Jesus as crucified, risen, and then present in our lives right now by the indwelling of the, of the Holy Spirit. Because only in a mature church, only in a mature church is love more than warm fuzzies. See, because in an immature church, love means, oh, everybody likes what I like. But it's just not that way. But in a loving, warm, fuzzy church, it means everybody's going to be the plumber and the carpenter, right? No. Love is light. And the light of the world is Jesus. Now that brings us to the closing part of chapter 4. And it's called living as children of, of uh, light. 
the, and it starts at verse 17. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. That's those who weren't raised in the study of Judaism, the non-Jews, those who were not familiar with one Yahweh God, but no longer live like, like, like they were, like hopeless and not confused, because they were worshiping the Greek gods and Roman gods and all of those kind of things. Their minds are full of darkness, and they wander far from, from, from the light that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts. Folks, today, that is happening in society. If a Christian says it's in the Bible, the world says, oh, that must be wrong. Folks, this hasn't changed. A mature Christian needs to be aware of this and ready. Verse 19 says they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly, and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Mature Christians are changed. In verse 20, he writes, But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful ways and your former way of life which is corrupted by lust and deception. By deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and, your, and your, uh, your, your, your attitudes. Put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and, and holy. You see, coming to a relationship in Christ is a life-changing experience, and it's an awesome experience. Most of us will never forget the day it's happened, and it haven't yet have, have happened. I pray it happens to you today. But when that happens, it means that you are not just changing now, but you will be changing throughout now, throughout eternity. So giving your life to Christ is awesome, but it's like Easter, which is where we started in this series. It's like Easter. It's just the beginning. It's not finished. If you never seek Christian the maturity, you will never know the fullness that this life is able to give you. You need to know that God has given all things through Jesus and that you can experience that by taking Jesus' yoke upon you, taking on the challenges that he brings and learn of him. This requires change and mature people accept and learn change. They don't always like it, folks. I don't like the change that COVID-19 has created. Yet if I take Jesus on, I know I know even when I don't know what's going on that God is in control. Mature churches are not satisfied with fun dinners and Easter egg hunts and parties and good music. All of that is an important part of the, 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 the church. But a mature church, a mature Christian church is not satisfied there. They want to know Jesus in a biblical sense. And that means intimately. And intimate means we're going to change. The closing verses of this chapter are, so stop telling lies in verse 25. You know, lies aren't just always, no, I didn't do that. Lies are sometimes convincing ourselves that we're in charge, that we're in control. Sometimes our lies are that we're always right. Our news channel's right. Our political party's right. Our neighborhood's right. Our denomination is right. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. What is truth? Jesus said, I, he is the truth. For we are all parts of the same body, and don't sin by letting anger to control you. Don't let the sun go down while, while you're, still ang you're, you're still angry. For anger gives a foothold to the, the uh, devil. If you are a thief, then quit stealing. And that doesn't always mean candy bars. You may be stealing time from God because you don't have time for that Bible study group. You don't have time for that prayer group. You don't have time to go sit alone and read your Bible because you need the time to fill out all the requirements of the world. Well, for the last couple of months, you, had, you haven't learned anything thing else predicting the future. Really isn't very, it really isn't very easy. Don't use foul language or abusive la the language in verse 29. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. If 
nothing else, remember what your great grandparents, your grand, your, your uh, grandparents said. If you got nothing good to say, then don't say anything at all. The need of encouragement when possible. But you know what? You have to be a person who is worth encouraging. You go, well, that's my attitude. It's just the way I am. People just have to accept me. Paul says, no, that's the problem in the church. See, because you're you're an immature Christian now. You have decided that your way is the only way. Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way that you live. Folks, doesn't it disturb you that we bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit? Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteed to you that you will be saved on the day of, of redemption. And then in closing, he writes, get rid of all the bitterness. Get rid of all the rage, the anger, the harsh words, the slander, as well as all types of evil the, 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 uh, behavior. Instead, be kind to each other. Oh, we pray that that had happened in Georgia. We pray that we were not running 2.23 miles this week at the loss of a human life on what appears to be and certainly almost certain to be a senseless act. Life is valuable. Paul says, get rid of the bitterness, the anger, and rage. It's all of these are evil, and this is Satan. Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. You know, although parts of the same body, Paul says, we all are parts of the same, that doesn't mean all dogs go, go to, to, to heaven. Remember, this began acknowledging that Christ alone ascended and descended. Christ alone gave gifts. So therefore, God can only be known to a mature Christian through the conversion and acceptance of the Holy Spirit given through Jesus Christ. And then by turning away from the old ways and forgiving others just as God has forgiven us. This week, let's grow some Christian the immaturity by turning away from our godless ways, by turning toward the Bible, and maybe even looking into theology a little bit, challenging ourselves that it's not just because of what somebody said, but because we actually have learned to be mature and figure it out on our own. Maturity in Christ and his church is essential, and it has nothing to do with age. Let us pray. Almighty God, there are folks watching us right now who are ready. They, they sense life changing. They, they sense for the first time that this Jesus is real to them. And we ask them right now to say, yes, Lord. I, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe Jesus is God and Jesus forgives my, my very sins. May they enter Christianity in an immature state ready to grow. And yet there are those of us who are waiting to recommit or, or, or to dig deeper to become mature. May we dig in and become mature. May we realize it's more than punching a ticket that we set in front of the television screen watching church, or that we set in a meeting, or that we sent a check. All of those are parts, but may we come to know who Jesus really is. And may we learn that he has chosen all of us, all colors, all sizes, all genders, to be the body of Christ.